वेलकम टू दिस टॉपिक ऑन प्री एनस्थीजिया इवेल्युएशन इट इज़ वन ऑफ द मोस्ट बेसिक थिंग्स दैट वी डू एवरी सिंगल डे एज एन एनस्थेटिस एंड टुडे आई एम जस्ट गोइंग टू ब्रश ओवर द थिंग्स दैट यू शुड नो मे बी देर आर मेनी थिंग्स दैट यू वुड बी एबल टू टीच मी बट दिस इज वॉट आई हैव रियलाइज ओवर माई जर्नी एज एन एनस्थेटिस डूइंग पी एस सीज फर्स्ट थिंग इज डोंट डू योर पी एस सी इन फाइव मिनट्स इट रियली मेक्स अ लॉट ऑफ डिफरेंस If you try to find out what are the problems in your patients, whether they are optimized or not, and also counsel the patient prior to surgery. Okay, so it makes a huge amount of difference as an anesthetist who gives five minutes for PAC and an anesthetist who gives fifteen minutes. Let's have a look at how we do pre-anesthesia evaluation. Now, what is the rationale of pre-anesthesia evaluation? First is to identify patients who could possibly develop anesthetic complications. and to provide protection for medical malpractice what do we mean by both of these if you want to identify patients who can develop malignant hypothermia or maybe not something so morbid some old 85 year old who has come and has a chance of developing post operative cognitive dysfunction or a 30 year old non smoking female who has come and has a high chance of post operative nausea and vomiting so you can ask them from their history do the examination get an idea of how their previous anesthetic experiences were and you can rule this out in the patients take care of the complications before they occur to provide protection for medical malpractice now remember whatever you write on the pre, pre anesthesia evaluation sheet also whatever you mark intraoperatively all of those things are documented they are kept in the patient's file or folder also kept in the hospital records and if there is a lawsuit that is filed against the surgeon or the anesthetist all of this is opened okay so they say na uh, chitta khol ke dekhte hain so it's basically they are going to go through all the documents that you have filled and if you have made any kind of mistake that is not acceptable as per the anesthesia protocols followed by the world then in that case you can have a big lawsuit filed against you and trust me i'm not just talking about this about foreign countries but also in india nowadays people are a lot more aware about healthcare insurance and uh, medical malpractices so they do file lawsuits and whatever you write is going to be held against you so aims of the pre anesthesia evaluation is to establish first of all why is the patient getting operated what is the type of disease that he is having what is the severity of disease that he is having besides what he is getting operated for what are the other comorbidities in that patient are those comorbidities controlled uncontrolled if they are then what are the investigations regarding it and what are your results to identify patients at high risk for intraoperative organ injury someone with already a damaged liver fatty liver disease someone with chronic kidney disease does this patient has a high chance of intraop organ injury okay so if he does you will write it in the pre anesthesia evaluation that patient is at a risk of this 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 maybe you will give a reference to the nephrologist who will write that yes there is moderate risk to the kidney because of the surgery so everywhere you have a documented you have explained to the patient there is a risk for kidney damage there is a risk for liver damage post operatively you might require icu support you might require dialysis so if the patient is prepared then it makes the work of an anesthetist as well as intensivist much easier as compared to some complication happening and then unexpectedly the patient uh, being in a state of complete panic ki ye kaise ho gaya i was not told about this that this is not going to happen okay next is estimate the perioperative risk using statistical risk models let me give you a small example of this we've done our entire chapter on ischemic heart disease there we used perioperative risk models like the lees revised cardiac index or the gupta's perioperative risk calculators so these risk calculators basically give us an idea of a patient who's already suffering from cardiac disease is going to undergo a surgery so what is his risk of perioperative cardiac events okay so if you have a number on the paper you use these risk calculators or risk indices and you tell the patient you counsel the patient that look there is a 2% chance that you can have a myocardial infarction perioperatively you're giving him a proper number then this patient knows what he is in for versus saying ha there is a chance of myocardial infarction or maybe it won't happen but it's less chance or more chance 
it's so much better when you use objective numbers as compared to subjective words. Then you want to find out the patients who are at risk and make sure that you optimize their health status before planning the periop management. For example, if you have a patient who is at high risk for cardiac events perioperatively and he is undergoing some small surgery, say he is undergoing some hernia repair. So in that case, the patient is at high cardiac risk. What you can do is because this is an elective surgery, you can take the time to optimize his health status. Try to optimize his cardiac status by starting medications if required, doing a coronary vascular vascularization. So all those things can be done to optimize before he's taken for elective surgery. But if he's taken for emergency surgery, you have no time for optimization. In that case, your pre-anesthesia evaluation will be focused on explaining to the relatives what is the risk of the surgery involved. Next, to provide objective information to patients, families and to familiarize them with protocols. Nowadays, it's Google dunya. Everyone wants to ask too many questions. So you give them the time to ask their questions, you answer their questions so that you develop a rapport with them and they know that you're giving the best care for your patient. At the end of all this question answer session, you are also going to make them sign an informed consent. So the patient as well as their relative will sign the informed consent that I have been explained everything regarding anesthesia that I will be given, my options and the complications associated with it. And I have understood it in my own language and I'm signing that consent, okay? So that protects you from every kind of legal implication. Now, when we do PAC, the, in the end, you know, we write or we mark this thing that the patient's ASA classification is this. So what is the ASA classification? ASA classification is nothing but American Society of Anesthesiologists Physical Status Classification, okay? So at the end of the entire PAC, we have to mark what is the risk of this patient to undergo this surgery under anesthesia, okay? So we divide this classification into six parts. So I always remember it like this, ASA physical status one, and then ASA physical status six. Beechka two, three, four, five, Khalia, okay? So I have not eaten it, but ASA physical patient one means there is a normal healthy patient and he has no comorbidities, okay? ASA physical status six means he is dead. When you say dead, why would you want to give anesthesia to a dead patient? Okay, so I am not giving anesthesia to a dead patient. This patient is brain dead. So I am harvesting organs from a brain dead patient. Again, brain dead patient is not going to have any reflexes. He is not going to have any movements during the surgery of organ harvesting. So why is he on the list? It is because even in a brain dead patient, you have to maintain the blood pressure. You have to maintain the organ vas uh, vascular supply and all the organ functions so that when you're removing the organs to harvest them like the kidney the liver they are in a good state to be transplanted into the recipient okay so that is the work of the anesthetist over there to maintain the hormonal balance and to maintain the blood pressure to the vital organs till the organs are harvested next is the beach car part which i ate okay now before six comes 5. What is 5? Five? 5 means the patient is almost dead. What do I mean by almost dead? Almost dead means if I do not operate on the patient, okay, if I don't operate on the patient, the patient will die. So this is a moribund patient who will die without surgery, okay. So here the patient is dead, the, here the patient is almost dead, okay. So for example, someone is walking on the road and he gets hit by a truck and there is a major splenic injury leading to abdominal hemorrhage. Now, if you don't do an emergency surgery in this patient, he is going to die. So that is ASA status five, okay? Then we have ASA status two, three, and four. I simply write over here, mild, moderate, and severe, okay? Now, what do I mean by mild, moderate, and severe? So this patient has a systemic disease. I'm going to write the systemic disease as SD now, which is mild in nature, moderate in nature, and severe in nature. So what is this? 
For example, there is a patient who has hypertension. He says that I'm taking the medications for hypertension and you check his blood pressure in PAC OPD, it is 120 by 80. So this is a controlled mild systemic disease. Okay. Now the patient says that same patient, different scenario. He says I have hypertension, I'm taking medications for it. You check your uh, his blood pressure in PAC OPD, it is 180 by 100. So here it is uncontrolled hypertension. Okay. Along with this, you ask whether there are any organ involvements, any end organ dysfunction in these patients. So you ask if there is hypertensive nephropathy, hypertensive retinopathy, the symptoms for all of those patients is no. Okay, so this is uncontrolled systemic disease, but no end organ dysfunction. No end organ dysfunction. So this is ASA status 3. Okay, ASA status 4 is severe systemic disease with end organ dysfunction and there is a very important word to it which is a constant threat to life. Okay, this is a constant threat to life. For example, this patient is coming to me, again I check his blood pressure, he is hypertensive, his blood pressure is 180 by 100, uncontrolled hypertensive. Along with this, he says he had stroke one year ago and nowadays he gets angina or chest pain. Okay, So there is a chance that he has end organ dysfunction and he has a chance of myocardial infarction because of the rise in the blood pressure. Okay, So this is a constant threat to his life and as a result of this, I place this patient in ASA status 4. So you saw how to remember ASA classification. One is absolutely healthy and normal, six is absolutely dead, five is almost dead, then you have two, three, four, which is mild, moderate and severe systemic disease. Now these are called as ASA physical status one, ASA physical status two. What about if someone is pregnant or if someone is a smoker or if someone is an alcoholic? Remember, pregnancy smoking and alcoholism, all of them come in ASA status 2. They don't come in ASA status 1. Okay. 